Okay, welcome back to the 17th century, and here's the cast of characters for today's show. At the start of class, we'll finish the careers of Philip IV and Velasquez, and then move on to France, where Philip's brother-in-law, Louis XIII, was in charge. His prime minister was the famous Cardinal Richelieu, and in their day, perhaps the greatest of all French philosophers and mathematicians, René Descartes, was doing his thinking. We'll also hear about Nicolas Poussin and the other important painters of the first half of the 17th century in France, and we'll wind up back in Rome to hear about Gian Lorenzo Bernini. If you could ask people from the 17th century who the greatest all-around genius of their day was, probably Rubens and Rembrandt, Newton and Galileo, would all get fewer votes than Bernini. So this is the statue of Philip IV, which we saw last time in the Plaza de Oriente in Madrid. Juan Martinez Montañez, considered by many to be the most important sculptor in the history of Spanish art, is given credit for it. But the casting was done in Italy by Pietro Tacca, who is said to have had the help of Galileo in the difficult business of balancing the horse on its back legs alone. By the early 1640s, things were not going well for Philip. As I mentioned last time, he had to fire his longtime Prime Minister Olivares, whom the Queen hated, and who was blamed for various political and mil military failings. There were revolts in Catalonia and Portugal. Then the King's brother, the Cardinal Infante, who was in charge of the Spanish Netherlands, died, and his replacement, de Mello, was defeated by the French under Louis the Duc de Condé at Rocroix in 1643. Here's an equestrian portrait of Philip now, very similar to the one we saw last time of Olivares. This was perhaps the model for the statue we just saw, but some think the statue was actually done first. In any case, we have the same stormy sky, and the subject is isolated hero in the way, again, Titian painted his great-grandfather, Charles V. The king is holding what's called a baton, by the way. These symbols of authority were usually hollow and could be used as something like mailing tubes in which messages could be sent. After winning his victory over the Spanish at Roquois, the 22-year-old French general, Louis de Bourbon, Duc de Condé, then came across France in 1644 to join the Catalan rebels in the Pyrenees, and they besieged the city of Lerida. Philip had appointed Luis Mendez de Haro, Olivari's nephew, to replace Olivares himself, but he made the decision to direct the campaign against Condé himself, even though he had no real military experience. Velasquez accompanied the king to the front and painted this portrait of him on the way to Lerida. For some reason, Philip could not grow a manly mustache, so he wore a, uh, an artificial one. And of course, Velasquez could always add a nice one to the portraits. As I said, he had no military experience, but the bottom line is that the Spanish were victorious and the French and the Catalans were driven away from the city. The joy of the victory was, however, tempered by news that the queen was ill and she died before the king could return to Madrid. This was a political as well as a personal blow to the country, because Philip and Isabel had had only one legitimate son, Balthazar Carlos, and he was not healthy either. The last thing Spain would need was a disputed succession. This is a portrait which Velasquez painted of Balthazar Carlos now, when he was just a little boy, painting the heir to the, that is when Balazar Carlos was just a little boy, uh, painting the heir to the throne of Spain as a boy, I suppose presents something like the same problem that faces an artist painting the baby Jesus. The trick is to make the subject look both like a child and yet like a child who could grow up to be the savior of mankind, or at least the savior of Spain. It's a difficult thing to pull off. Now, soon after Philip arrived back to find that his wife had died, he received word that his sister, who had married the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II, had also died. And then this boy, his son, Balthazar Carlos, the Hope of Spain, came down with malaria or smallpox, according to some authorities, a few months after that, and died at the age of 17. 
This was in 1646, and within two years then, the king had lost his wife, his sister, and his only son. Here's the picture up closer, and there's no doubt Velasquez has given him a real presence in this portrait. And in a detail like this now, you can get some idea, too, of how amazing Velasquez's technique is. This just becomes blobs and splotches up close, and in some places, the canvas shows right through the paint. Yet at ordinary viewing distance, all this resolves itself into something that looks not like a photograph, but like the boy himself. Velasquez, surprisingly, I suppose, never painted the baby Jesus for Philip, but he could have done the job. This now is Velasquez's portrait of Juan de Perea, who is sometimes euphemistically called his assistant or servant, but who was legally his slave. In 1970, the New York Metropolitan Museum bought this for $5 million, which at that time was the highest price ever paid for a painting. In 1648, Velasquez made a second trip to Italy, this time primarily to buy works of art for Philip. It doesn't seem like it would have been a good time for this. The Austrian Habsburgs had just signed the Peace of Westphalia with the French, leaving Philip to fight them on his own. And he had also had to, by that treaty, acknowledge the independence of Holland, although giving up the hopeless job of getting Holland back was a definite plus for Spain and everything but ego. In any case, Velasquez set off and took Perret here with him and painted this portrait of him in Rome, which was then displayed to general amazement and praise. Perea was, if technically a, a, a slave, at least Velasquez's de facto assistant and prepared his paints and canvases, things like that, and also did painting himself. Regardless of what his legal status was, he comes across as self-respect personified, and dignity is much more, uh, uh, of course, a function of that than social position. He was eventually freed by Velasquez, according to tradition, because a picture which Perea himself had painted was mistaken by the king for a work by Velasquez. Sister Wendy, if her opinion matters to you, calls this the greatest painting ever. While he was in Rome, Velasquez also painted this portrait of the Pope, Innocent X Pamphilii, which the Pamphilii family still owns to this day. I don't know how hard it was for Velasquez to make a slave look dignified, but it might seem to be an even greater challenge to make a man wearing a lace skirt look dignified, and he's done that too. Pache's sister Wendy, this is usually considered Velasquez's greatest portrait, and Joshua Reynolds called it the most beautiful thing in Rome. A whole book could be written comparing these two portraits, but I do think this is the more impressive. Ironically, I think that's partly because Perea actually has a touch of the pompous about him, almost as though he really were an aristocrat posing as a slave. Innocent looks like he was too busy to pose. He doesn't care what you think of him. He doesn't care whether he looks like he's any better than anybody else. Get on with it, Velasquez. Get on with it. I have to get this letter off to the King of France and then deal with the Venetian ambassador and go someplace else and say mass if I have the time. Here he is up closer. When Velasquez showed him the finished portrait, the Pope, with a wry smile perhaps, judged it troppo vero, too true, too true. He was 76 at the time, though, and most of us would be well pleased to look this good at 76. Velasquez refused payment for it, but he told the Pope he wanted very much to get into the Spanish Order of Knighthood, the Order of Santiago, and the Pope immediately advised the Spanish Nuncio to put in a word for him. It was done, and he was eventually admitted. Velasquez was so popular in Italy, he kept postponing his return to Madrid, and only after the king essentially commanded him to return did he do so. And by that time, the king had married his second wife, his 15-year-old niece, Marianne of Austria, the daughter of his recently deceased sister. 
Mariana's hairstyle, invented by some beautician, I think, who wanted to make a fashion statement, makes her one of the most recognizable people in Spanish history. She must have found the look appealing because she kept it her whole life. Whether or not marriage was a personal necessity for Philip, it was a political one which he recognized. It was his obligation to produce a male heir. After several years of marriage, his son Felipe was born in 1557, but he was never healthy and died at the age of four. Then in 1661, the future Carlos II was born, apparently inheriting all the bad parts of the Habsburg DNA as a result of way too many family marriages. All eight of his great-grandparents were direct descendants of Juan of the Mad. He was soon to be known as Carlos the Crazy, the Bewitched, El Hechizado, and we'll hear more about him later. Their first child, however, was an apparently normal daughter, Margarita, born in 1652, and this is one of several pictures of her at various ages, painted by Velasquez and sent off to relatives in Vienna. It didn't matter that she was healthy and the oldest, she could not have the throne. Here she is, a few years older, wearing the kind of dress that it would seem could only have been worn for a portrait, but fashion is always blind to how bizarre it's going to look to the future. So the good news is she was healthy, but the bad news is that she had to go off to Austria and marry her ugly 26-year-old Uncle Leopold when she was 14, and she died in childbirth at the age of 21. She's also the center of attention in this picture. Las Meninas are the maids of honor now in the Prado. This was painted in 1656 when she would have been four and she's shown not only with maids but a dog, a dwarf, people usually identified as other servants or tutors, and of course Velasquez himself at the left painting something on a large canvas. At the back of the room there is what seems to be a mirror reflecting the images of the king and queen. Are they to be imagined standing then, outside the picture in our space? And is Velasquez looking at them as he works on their portraits, which he's painting on that big canvas? Marguerite and the others would then, I guess, be present to keep the royal couple company during the posing session. I think that this is likely the way we are supposed to interpret the clues, but some think that the mirror reflects the images on the canvas. Others think that Velasquez is actually painting the picture we see now, and that Philip and Mariana are reflected in the mirror because they were also in the studio watching him work on it. Regardless of what Velasquez is painting on the canvas in the picture, however, this painting is remarkable in a lot of ways, not least just because of its subject. It's essentially a genre painting, though set not in a tavern or a barnyard, but in the royal palace of what we're led to think was as rigid and formal a court as there was to be found in Europe. We've seen Peter Bruegel paint ordinary peasant life, Vermeer paint ordinary middle class life, and now we have Velasquez paint ordinary royal life. Spain is not the place one would expect this kind of thing to have been done first. By common consent, and perhaps by Philip's consent as well, Velasquez's greatest painting is not some heroic treatment of the king himself or a great event. It's a picture of a slice of palace life, no more significant than any other. Kenneth Clark calls this the greatest picture ever painted based on the facts of vision alone, which suggests again that he thinks it looks like a photograph, but of course it doesn't. I challenge anyone to try to recreate this scene and then take a picture of it that would look enough like this to be confused with it. As I said when I showed the detail from the portrait of Balthazar Carlos, at the distance from which this is meant to be seen, it looks not like a photograph of reality, but like reality itself. And again, that's all the more amazing. Because the closer you get to it, the more it almost comes to resemble 
almost randomly and certainly imprecisely applied daubs and marks. Of all great painters, I think Velasquez is the one who makes it seem the easiest to be a great painter. Van Eyck's is the style that looks the most technically demanding, but this scene, again, at ordinary viewing distance, looks more, much more like a piece of the real world than anything Van Eyck painted. And that's because Velasquez knew how to distort the world to fool the eye into thinking it's seeing the undistorted world. This, in a way, is what Impressionism is all about, painting the world other than you know it to be, so it will actually nevertheless look more right to the eye than if you tried to meticulously reproduce everything in it. We're going to see some more details from Las Meninas now. This is the whole girl who goes with that hand we just saw up close. And we're going to hear a pavan by the 17th century Spanish guitarist and composer Gaspar Sanz, who is incidentally also considered the first serious composer to use the famous theme called La Falia, the origin of which is unknown. It's sometimes said to have been a Celtiberian fertility dance or something like that. In any case, it was borrowed and adapted by many, many later composers, including Corelli, Gemignani, Marin Murray, Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, not to mention Vangelis, who used it for the score of the movie 1492. We'll hear a couple of versions of this famous piece when we get to the more famous composers who arranged them. But as I said, this is Sanz's Pavan for guitar. <laughs> This is the dwarf at the right in the whole picture with her apparently normal son. The court was full of these human pets and Velasquez painted several of them very sympathetically. Another of the maids. of the king and queen uh, seen as through a glass darkly. And their daughter Margarita up close. corsage on her dress, which someone has said looks like a salad or like something she spilled on herself. Here's Velasca's palette. And Velasquez himself. But is this the picture of a man who was close to 60, which Velasquez was when this was painted? I won't even suggest that it's not Velasquez. We'll just assume he used forgivable artistic license here. By the time he painted this, he had been named Phillips Chamberlain, and shortly after it was finished, he was admitted to the prestigious Order of Santiago, the Red Cross of which is said to have been painted on his jacket by the king himself. In 1559, when the war between France and Spain that had continued on even after the official end of the Thirty Years' War was finally brought to an end with the signing of the Peace of the Pyrenees, the agreement included the marriage of Louis XIV, the King of France, to his cousin, Maria Theresa, Philip's daughter by his first wife, Isabel, the sister of Louis XIII. Velasquez, as Chamberlain, was one of those involved in making the complicated preparations for the wedding at San Sebastian on the coast. And although the wedding went off very well, he apparently contracted malaria there and returned to Madrid with only a few months to live. He died in August 1660 and was buried in the church of San Juan Batista, which used to be here, where this monument now marks the site of his burial. Oh,
Philip died five years later, leaving the throne of Spain to his son, who was helpless, deformed, retarded, and for a king, worst of all, impotent. And his lack of an heir just postponed what Philip had feared, a war over the Spanish succession. And we'll hear about that war next quarter. Right now, however, we're going to France to see what was going on there, more or less, during the period Philip IV was on the throne of Spain. those pictures we heard about earlier this quarter which Rubens painted depicting the chief events in the life of the queen and soi-disant French heroine Marie de Medici. Her husband Henry IV is here shown as a ghost handing over to her the power to rule France as regent on behalf of their nine-year-old son Louis XIII. Louis was lucky to survive this regency but he must have been lucky because the treatment he received as a child, though well-intentioned, I guess, might have killed most children. His doctor, a fellow named Erouard, kept a detailed diary of the boy's childhood and especially his medical treatment. In one year, he was given 215 enemas and bled 47 times. It's surprising there was anything left of him at all after that. And then he was accused of being lazy and lethargic, especially in comparison to his more lively younger brother Gaston, whom his mother preferred to him his whole life. Here's a portrait of him now as a grown man. It was painted by Philippe de Champagne, who was sort of Louis' answer to Velasquez, although the, the latter is always ranked well above Champagne by art historians. Champagne's style is very different. The word dry is sometimes used in connection with it. Sometimes his paintings look almost like they were done with colored pencils rather than anything as viscous as oil. The quick story of Marie's Regency, and we heard a bit about it earlier in connection with the Rubens project for her, is that in collusion with some favorites, she attempted essentially to loot the country. In 1617, when Louis was still just 16, he and the Duke de Ligne, the man he trusted the most, arranged the assassination of one of Marie's most notorious henchmen, an Italian named Concini. This might seem a bit drastic, but most historians think Concini had it coming. Marie herself was also placed under something like house arrest at Blois, but she is said to have escaped by tying bedsheets together and climbing down them. If she looked like she did in the picture we just saw, that's a bit hard to visualize, but Somehow she did get away and rejoin her supporters. This is a portrait of Cardinal Richelieu by Champagne. Richelieu arrived in Paris in 1614 as a delegate to the Estates, the Estates General from Luçon, of which he was bishop near La Rochelle. And he decided immediately that Paris was where he belonged, not Luçon, which he called the nastiest place in the country, the baker's field of France. He attached himself to the cause of Marie and thereby made one of the few political misjudgments of his career. When she was exiled, he was too, and his career could have ended right there. However, he was able to arrange at least a temporary reconciliation between mother and son, and when the Duc de Ligne died in 1624, Louis named Richelieu to be Prime Minister with Marie's support as well, and he was on his way to becoming the man many consider France's greatest statesman. This is another portrait of him by Champagne. In 1626, with the approval of the king, he issued edicts forbidding the private settling of quarrels by dueling and requiring the dismantling of all fortresses not considered integral to the defense of France. In Dumas' Three Musketeers, on the day D'Artagnan arrives in Paris, he's challenged to three duels. That's, of course, uh, uh, an exaggeration. But still, men were fighting out their quarrels all the time, taking the law into their own hands, and that was inconsistent with Richelieu's peace in the streets policy. Charming as the musketeer scofflaws are, they're behaving like gang members in Oakland. 
and from a moral, if not a dramatic perspective, we should cheer, not boo, when the Cardinals men show up to try to stop their lighthearted attempts to kill each other. <laughs> And here's Champagne's triple portrait of the Cardinal. This edict of Richelieu's did not sit well with the nobility, and the one requiring the dismantling of fortress wa fortresses was perhaps even more offensive. The French nobility took very seriously the notion that a man's home was his castle, or chateau as the case may be, and this edict struck at the heart of noble independence. In 1628, he directed the royal army to take the Protestant stronghold of La Rochelle, but to the irritation of many Catholics. This was done in the interest of political rather than religious unity, and those who survived the siege were left free to worship as Protestants, providing they were loyal to France. Richelieu based his policy on Henry IV's Edict of Nantes, which had guaranteed Protestants freedom of worship in most of France except Paris, providing they were loyal to the government. <laughs> This is the Luxembourg Palace now from the air. Today it houses the French Senate, but it was built by Marie to house herself in her own court. You may remember that it also originally housed the pictures she commissioned from Rubens, which are now in the Medici Gallery of the Louvre. Despite Richelieu's reconciliation of Marie and Louis, by the late 1620s, she had become very jealous of the Cardinal's influence over the King, and it was not hard for her to find supporters among the nobility irritated by Richelieu's sword control laws and the new requirements for building permits at chateaus. Here's the palace at ground level now. In 1630, she gave her son an ultimatum. Either she or the Cardinal <clears throat> must go. Louis did not give an immediate response, but when he did, it was to confirm that Richelieu was his man, and that Marie should retire to her chateau at Moulin. Instead, she left the country and spent the rest of her life plotting against Louis, Richelieu, and France with declining effect, until she died poor and forgotten in Cologne in 1642. The palace, we see, was built for her by the French architect Salomon de Brosse, and he was a apparently uh, told to take his inspiration from the Pitti Palace in Florence where Marie had been born and spent her youth, but this doesn't look much like the Pitti Palace. One thing worth noticing about it though is that the roof is close to being flat, and that is an Italian architectural feature which the French did not fully adopt until about Louis XIV's day, but we're close to that here. <music> In 1632, Louis's younger brother, Gaston, openly revolted against him and won the support of many of the nobility, but the revolt collapsed within the year <clears throat> after the defeat of the rebel army by the royal win at Castle Naudry. Many of the leading noble rebels who had put their lives on the line in Gaston's rebellion were executed after his defeat, but I guess the king felt he couldn't hang his own brother, so he was placed under house arrest at Blois but I'm not sure this was the kind of punishment to deter repeat offenders. This was not exactly like a cell at San Quentin. He had the Gaston d'Orléans wing, which you see here, and which is named after him built as the last major addition to this, one of the most venerable and architecturally interesting of all French chateaus. The architect of Gaston's wing was François Mansart, uncle of the more famous Jules Ardouin Mansart, and virtually the whole decorative vocabulary of this place is Italian, with the exception again of the roof, which is still high in the old French style. Here's a look at the interior now, which has been undergoing extensive restoration on and off for the last 20 years or so. There is, I think, no furniture in it yet, but you can tell from the dome in this view how splendid a place it was. Gaston actually lived mostly in the older Francois Premier wing, though because the work on this wing dragged on and on and on and was still not entirely finished by the time he died in 1660. 
This is Louis's wife, Louis XIII's wife, Anne of Habsburg, or of Austria, as she is usually known, in a portrait by Rubens, although I have my doubts about that attribution. In any case, Anne was the sister of Philip IV, as we've heard, and is the Queen of France with whom the Duke of Buckingham had his most famous affair, the one recounted in The Three Musketeers, in which book she appears a good deal more radiant and charming than she does in this picture. Louis is often alleged to have been homosexual, and for 23 years, Anne and Louis had no children, until, so the tradition goes anyway, they were forced to sleep in the same bed when they arrived unexpectedly at a chateau that only had one bed. And the result of this accidental encounter was Louis XIV, perhaps France's most famous, most important, most influential king. As I mentioned earlier, Louis married Philip's sister, Philip IV of Spain's sister, and Philip married his sister, and then France and Spain fought one another all through the Thirty Years' War and then for another year, 11 years after that. This anonymous painting depicts the Spanish army under the Cardinal Infante retreating toward the Netherlands after the French victory over them in 1641. As I also mentioned earlier, this was one of the things that led to the fall of Olivares because the Cardinal Infante, Philip IV's brother, blamed him for poor intelligence information and for generally inadequate support. The next year, the Cardinal Infante Ferdinand died and was replaced by de Mello, who was defeated at Roquois, as we've heard, by the 22-year-old military prodigy Louis de Bourbon, the Duc de Condé. And this is an anonymous painting now of the Battle of Roquois in eastern France, with Condé on the white horse presiding over the victory. We heard earlier how he followed this up by joining the Catalan rebels who were defeated by the Spanish when Philip IV himself came from Madrid to take command of the army. Condé was to go on to become involved in all sorts of self-seeking plots, including conspiracies with the Spanish, but he'll eventually become one of the great French heroes of Louis XIV's day, and we'll hear more about his adventurous life next week and see his chateau as Chantilly. If you wonder how a 22-year-old could rise so high so fast in the army, it's partly because he was the great-grandson of Henry IV's brother, partly because he married Richelieu's niece, and partly, too, because he was a daredevil soldier of the sort men respected. Neither the king nor Richelieu, however, lived to enjoy the victory at Roquois. This is Champagne's portrait of Cardinal Richelieu on his deathbed, and he died a few months before the battle. Louis XIII himself died just four days before it. They also did not live to see the Treaty of Westphalia at the end of the Thirty Years' War then, but it was, as we've heard, largely Richelieu's maneuvering that kept the Habsburgs from getting anything out of that war except a good deal of self-destruction. This is the Palais Royal as it looks from the air today, but it was originally the Palais Cardinal and was built for Richelieu just north of the Louvre. He willed it to the king on his death, so it became known then as the Palais Royal. In his day, however, it consisted only of the area around the courtyard at the upper right. The long wings beside the garden were erected by a later Duc d'Orléans as a real estate investment, and the Palais Royal is still a good address. In 1653, Richelieu sponsored the establishment of the Académie Française at No. 4 Rue Valois, which was just across the street from his residence. Its original purpose was to produce a dictionary which would purify and standardize the French language and honor those who used it well to write great literature. Napoleon made it part of the Institut de France, uh, now housed in the former Palais Mazarin, which we'll see next week. Here's the section that Richelieu called home off the courtyard at the south end of the whole complex, it was built by Le Mercier, who also built the oldest surviving part of the Louvre and contributed to several other important projects. Since 1986, the courtyard here has been filled up with an installation done by the soi-disant artiste Daniel Buren. He's been in the news recently complaining that the government is allowing it to deteriorate 
and he wants $3 million to restore it. The Academy is constantly at work revising its dictionary to this day. The latest edition was published in 1992, although it has less and less influence on how the language is actually used. And there are other dictionaries which are certainly more widely consulted in France. The Academy has long been known for conservatism in its approach. Americanisms, regardless of how widely used, are anathema to many, although the 1992 edition does contain such examples of franglais as les blue jeans, la cover girl. Marguerite Yourcenar became the first woman admitted to the French Academy about 20 years ago. Authors, whether male or female, who have not been admitted for various reasons could form a pretty impressive salon de refusé themselves. It would include Moliere, Zola, Stendhal, and Balzac. This is a portrait of Pierre de Cornet and the great literary event of Richelieu's day of the reign of Louis XIII was the premiere of his play Le Cid, usually considered the first great work of French drama. He set the play in Spain, Le Cid is El Cid, perhaps to avoid controversy over how he was treating France, but duels are a main feature in the play and reminded theater goers of the good old days when Paris was more like Dodge City. And the king of Spain is made to say, I am a man like other men, which he no doubt was, but that came across to Richelieu as controversially populist, and the end result was that he asked the Academy to issue an unfavorable critique of the work. This critique did not, however, take the tone he wanted. The play was, as it were, praised with faint condemnation, but Corneille dedicated his next play to the Cardinal and said that he got some of his best ideas from him and the controversy blew over and Cornet was admitted to the Academy. This is the Place de Vosges in Paris, which is the biggest chunk of 17th century Paris still surviving. Louis XIII's father, Henry IV, had started the project here when the Hotel de Tournelle, abandoned by Catherine de' Medici after her husband Henry II's death, uh, had once stood. A lot of famous people have lived here over the years, including Victor Hugo, Alphonse Daudet, the mystery writer Georges Simenon, and Madame de Sévigné, who was born here. Although he probably never lived here, uh, Richelieu himself apparently owned number 21 Place de Vosges at the upper left. In any case, his famous grandnephew, the Duc de Richelieu, lived here for some time in the 18th century. And you see that section at ground level now. Today, part of the Place has architectural digest quality flats and other parts are completely dilapidated. There's a morass of bureaucratic red tape that has to be fought through by anyone who wants to restore any of it to make it livable, so a good part of it is just empty. I think the greatest French philosopher of the age, and arguably the greatest French philosopher ever, René Descartes probably lived uh, in the Place de Vosges at some time. I, I say that simply because he was constantly moving, and so must have hit this at least once. This is another view of the Place today. Descartes is generally thought of now as a mathematician. He introduced the use of letters to represent unknown in unknowns in algebra, and the use of superscripts to represent numbers which are to be squared, cubed, and so on, and made great progress in what's now called analytic geometry. He also certainly qualifies as a scientist and devoted a lot of time especially to anatomical study. His rationalist attitude often put him at odds with the church, although he remained a nominal Catholic his whole life. He spent many years in Holland because of the more tolerant attitude he found there, although the hardline Calvinists also gave him some trouble. He was in Holland throughout the 1630s and became a good friend of Constantine Huygens, whom you may remember was also a friend of Rembrandt, so Descartes and Rembrandt may have met, although there's no record of such a thing. On the other hand, Descartes not only met Franz Halls, he was painted by him, as we see here. The work for which he is best known now is the Meditations, the 
last significant effort to try to prove by reason that God exists. In his argument, in brief, he tries to establish that all sources of knowledge are potentially deceptive. The only thing of which he can be certain is that he exists. Even if he is subject to constant deception, the very fact that's happening implies he exists. Cogito ergo sum. I think, I have ideas, therefore I must exist, even if I'm subject to constant deception. But, he goes on, one of his ideas is so clear and so profound that it could not have been created by anything less great than the thing of which it is the idea. And this is the idea of God, an all-perfect benign being, who would not have created us subject to random deceptions without also giving us tools to detect and correct them. So we can, with proper precaution, rely on our senses, mathematics, and so on. This argument has probably made no more converts to Christianity than any other such arguments, but it brought up questions about knowledge, what we can be said to know, how we know, so on, that are still under discussion today. Blaise Pascal was Descartes' contemporary and one of the real geniuses of the day also. When he was still in his teens, he made this primitive computer, actually a kind of adding machine to help his father, who was a tax collector. He was to go on, Pascal, to make major contributions to mathematics and the sciences generally. He was among the first to measure air pressure and to understand the concept of a vacuum and is given credit for important advances in the study of hydraulics. This is an anonymous portrait of him. Although a nominal Catholic like Descartes, he was a Catholic more simply by birth than by religious conviction. However, on November 23, 1654, he was being driven in a carriage over the Pont Neuilly. Something frightened the horses, and they plunged over the side into the river, nearly taking the carriage he was in with them. He fainted and reported when he regained consciousness that he had seen a vision of God, a much more intense sort of conversion experience than Descartes' meditations are likely to produce. He wrote down then what is called his confession. In effect, he says that he is reconciled to God, not to the mechanical God of Descartes and the philosophers who made the laws of the universe and then essentially abandoned us, but to the God of the Bible, who looks after us and who offers consoling hope and answer to our prayers. He then became a member of the Port Royal uh, community of Jansenists. Jansenists were, in a sense, the most left-wing of Catholic groups. They believed in predestination and, like Luther and Calvin, were critical of the traditional church's methods of dealing with guilt and punishment via the institutions of penance and indulgence. They also took a more mystical approach to theology, emphasizing the individual's capacity to enter into a relationship with God independent of the church. His most famous work, the Pensee Thoughts, was written at Port Royal, which used to be uh, right here near Paris. In this work, he writes from something like a modern existentialist viewpoint. I think he was among the first to fully comprehend the meaning of the theory of Copernicus. Not only was man no longer the center of the physical universe, at, at, at least, that universe was unimaginably bigger than anyone had believed possible. All this visible world, wrote Pascal, is but an imperceptible element in the great bosom of nature. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces frightens me, he wrote. George de la Tour is now regarded as one of the most important painters of Louis XIII's day, and although his pictures are difficult to date, the Legion of Honor in San Francisco owns this and a companion picture which many now think are as early as surviving pictures. They may be genre subjects, but some think they were meant to be displayed in something like a theater lobby and represent stock theatrical characters like the nagging housewife here, and then her henpecked husband. 
these pictures, despite the fact that there isn't a lot of apparent detail in them, are meticulously rendered. They seem to have gotten too much attention really to have just been something like theater posters. This now is the sort of thing for which De La Tour is more famous, dramatically candlelit subjects influenced by Caravaggio and more immediately probably by the Utrecht school of Dutch painters. This is Mary Madeline in the New York Metropolitan Museum. And this is Joseph the Carpenter with Jesus who appears here as an actual boy for one of the few times in the history of art. Usually we see him, of course, as either a baby or as a grown man. The Legion of Honor also has what may be the earliest surviving work by Louis Lenin, Peasants in Their Yard. There are, in fact, very few paintings anywhere now that can be attributed to Louis Lenin. This may also be a picture connected with the theater. It's, it's possibly inspired by some passage in a play, the way the figures are sort of leaning against the frame, as it were, on either side. This makes it look almost like they're leaning against the sides of a stage. If this is a genre painting, and that's what most think, then it may be the first to really treat peasant life in so sympathetic a way. Bruegel certainly paints realistic peasant life, but his people usually give no hint that they might have, as it were, been put in the wrong socioeconomic subclass. They're ugly, befitting their low status, and seem resigned to their lot. Velasquez's water cellar is certainly treated sympathetically, but this may have been painted before he was. And in any case, this picture seems more like an overt attempt to inspire general sympathy for the class of people represented and the hardships they endure. De La Tour and Lenain were certainly highly regarded in their day. De La Tour was named Peintre du Roi by Louis XIII, and Louis Lenain was made an original member of the Academy de Beaux-Arts founded by Mazarin on Louis XIV's day. But the greatest French painter of the early 17th century was Nicolas Poussin, and after the break we'll hear about him and see some of the important chateaus of Louis XIII's day, and then begin the career of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Music 